So we've now got Harding along to Conscience TV and we're going to find out what the dreams of an eco-spiritual futurist are. One planet, one experiment. You know, we, we don't get an, a second go at this. You know, yeah. We're going to do it right or, or we'll, we'll destroy the whole planet, which is, of course, a, a, a serious risk. And, and, I've, and I've sort of struggled with this tension quite a bit because it's, it's quite clear that we're, we're doing very serious damage to the environment and, and something has to be done about that. And the amount of stuff is increasing exponentially. That means it's, it's, it's a, not a, a steady increase like this. It's, a, it's an exponential, a geometric increase, it doubling with every period of time. So, so we're actually at that point where we're about neck and neck with the biosphere. And if we have another doubling, we're going to completely overwhelm it. Yeah. Because it seemed to me that the essence of the problem from a technological perspective was that we have an industrial economy on the planet, which is processing materials. It's, uh, you know, we, we dig things up from the Earth's crust, we cut down trees and so on. We process these materials. They, they go through the kind of economic domain and earn money. And then we just throw away all the material residue. And the kind of numbers that I could find around that time were that every, every one kilogram or every pound, if you like, of, of uh, finished goods that you buy in the shops, 20 kilograms of waste have been created upstream. And within six months of purchase, on average, half of the kilogram is already waste. So there's a colossal level of waste. So these days, as a futurist, what do you suggest to people in terms of when you work for well, companies? I mean, did the, you know, I quite often give presentations around this kind of thing. And, and they, those presentations tend to have sort of two, two themes. One is that there's a technical set of solutions, which are broadly along the lines that I've just been describing. In other words, we can, we can close the materials loops. We can change the way we manufacture things in order to reduce this flow of waste. That's, that's technically feasible. It doesn't require new technology in the sense of fundamental breakthroughs. It's, what it really requires is redesign of existing know-how. And then that also needs to be side by side with some kind of change of, of, of mind, if you like. And all the studies that have been done, going right back to the limits to growth in the 1970s, showed that in order to, to achieve sustainability, you have to not only change the technology, but also change social values or social behaviors. If you just did one or the other, you still got the collapse, you know, this collapse. But it was only when you did both at once that you, the situation stabilized. This, therefore, the sort of other half of, of my message and also my research has been to ask the question, well, is there any chance that we will change? We will have a change of mind in time to deploy the technology because we've got the technology there in principle, but are we going to change? So I've become very interested in the work around cultural values change. So there's the whole phenomenon of the so-called cultural creative shift in value that Paul Ray has uh, been researching. So you... The researchers were astonished by the results. They found 50 million people creating a new culture with new ways of life, values and world views. In the mainstream media, this seldom gets any mention. Today, they number approximately 200 million around the world. Well, uh, a shift, basically what seems to be going on is a shift in, in, the, in the fundamental cultural beliefs and values from the ideas of, of modernity, the sort of rather materialistic ideas that, okay. you know, this is all we see around us is all there is and, uh, you know, it's, it's a physical universe and, and so on, um, to, a, to a position which is much more aligned around these, these uh, you know, concerns about the environment, concerns about social justice, there are social element to it, also personal development, both psychological and spiritual. And it's a, it seems to be a whole bundle of... Uh, you know, com new beliefs, a completely new way of looking at the world. But as a futurist, of course, I was interested not simply in the idea that it's reported that this change is going on, but in how quickly it's going on and when it might get to the point where it would seriously change things. Because that's, you know, that, that's, that's sort of an interesting question. Uh, when, you, when you apply the forecasting technique to that and you look at how the numbers are gradually rising, as the numbers rise, of course, it means that the old value uh, set, the old way of thinking, is gradually coming down because this is a you know, finite you know, 100% of the population. And if you're gradually getting an increase in one set, the other is coming down. And the interesting point is, where do they meet? Because at the point where these two curves cross over, the new value uh, set is, is suddenly the dominant one. 
and the old value set of modernity has crossed over and has become the you know the the the, the diminishing one but this happens immediately at, at the crossover point it does seem that things can collapse quite fast now well, things could change very fast if the underlying belief system has suddenly you know the dominant underlying belief system has just been swapped for another one then things could change extremely rapidly and I, and just to cut <laughs> finish the, the the previous line of thought the the when i ran the forecasting uh, approach it showed that the crossover was actually just about now you know 2011 or approximately i mean there's, there's a you know a, a little you know it's not absolutely precise but it would be around now not in 10 years not 10 years ago but just about now so that that is very interesting in terms of the potential now for quite rapid change in this direction examples of the, of the new emerging would you say well of course i think one of the prime examples you know is, the, is what existed in the number of ngos that existed in the world and uh, discovered that it was that was rising exponentially small grassroots organizations all around the planet mm -hmm. that are acting on behalf of you know environmental issues social justice issues you know uh, awareness raising and consciousness raising issues there's a there's a ferment of grassroots change which is invisible as far as the, the the dominant media are concerned or the dominant mindset but is is you know i would say strong evidence for this this underlying sort of ferment of change now the, to the point where almost 50 percent of the population in developed countries even if they might not be saying so have actually shifted to this new this new way of thinking those themes moving away from co competition towards cooperation is part of this overall shift yes but of course this means that all the institutions and, and organizational forms that we've had in the past which were suited to this rapid growth period that we've been going through for sort of 200 years are all going to have to change and because it seems like wherever you look all the old structures that we've been used to are, are kind of falling apart you know you give the example of the newspaper industry or whatever it is everything just seems to be coming apart at the seams but that could be exactly what we need in order to have a completely fresh start now from my kind of professional future uh reason, futures research stance we don't know is well what is said is the truisms of this profession now, none of us know for sure what's going to happen and that means that you can't prove the case for either optimism or pessimism in advance. We may have lots of fears, you know, but we also have hopes, but you can't actually prove the case in advance. But if you're optimistic, you're much more likely to take actions that are going to lead to a good outcome because you believe that this might be possible. If you're pessimistic, you think, well, the game's over. There's no point trying. So my efforts to do that kind of thing are deliberately an effort to construct uh, an optimistic case. I, I can't prove it, but I do believe it's really important that, that a, a well-argued, credible, optimistic uh, future sort of outcome can actually be seen, can be portrayed. This idea that by, by now we're just at this sort of 50% mark in a change of cultural values, but that these people are still somewhat in the closet, let's say, uh, what it means is that even in corporations, that half of the people in the corporation actually have a have a value set which is probably at variance with the kind of official story about what a corporation is supposed to be about a, a group of, of people who were on the cusp as it were between these two value sets they were still holding on to the, the the modern way of thinking the modernist way of thinking because they wanted it to be proved that it was viable to move into this new world but as soon as some kind of as soon as they would see that it was really credible in practical terms they could kind of make a living and this kind of thing in this new world then they would kind of make make the shift so that that seems to me the, the sort of thing one might be looking for the, the means of getting from the old to the new you know ingenious business models of, of that kind that, that make the transition ecotricity is interesting because its business model is one as a transitional business model so they decided that rather than selling purely green electricity from the outset they would sell you know brown electricity across the grid that they would buy in the way an ordinary company would but they would use all the proceeds to invest in a bigger and bigger fleet of renewable power sources or windmills so that that seems to me the, the sort of thing one might be looking for the, the means of getting of course the whole what we haven't touched on is the, the whole dynamics of the internet and uh, the way information technology is changing the way society communicates so the mass media and, and the mass broadcasters and newspapers and so on were the, the dominant cultural form of, of communication in, in the past but clearly the inter the way the internet works is many many to many it's not this kind of mass you know one-way communication and i think we're now just about 
beginning to get the hang of how to work that. You know, on, on a practical level, we're in a very mm. serious situation. Yeah. But as you say, there's hope. Mm. And I do think that all of these things are converging to produce a kind of transformation, a, a cultural, a planetary uh, tra transformation, because we, we cannot keep going. This existing situation cannot keep going. But I, I really do feel that there is, there is a tide turning now. And uh, you know, we really are moving, potentially, you know, there's, there's still risk, but potentially moving into a new world. So as always, but extra special now, now is the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Harleen, thank you very much for coming along and chatting. Sure. It's been it's been really interesting. Thank you.